And welcome everybody to another Smart Money Circle show. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is Brian Spinelli, who's the co-CIO of Halbert Hargrove with approximately $3 billion in assets under management. Brian, thank you so much for taking the time and welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you, Adam. So Brian, I always like to ask, can you tell us a little about your story and how you got to where you are today, please? My story is a little unconventional, but how I ended up at Halbert Hargrove actually started with me mowing a neighbor's lawn in high school. Oh, wow. So, kind of funny, <laughs> but uh, a neighbor across the street uh, had a local CPA firm. And so a lot of his clients that would come in and have issues with investment management or looking for an advisor, he would refer to Halbert Hargrove. Okay. So I was this teenager that would just mow his lawn on Friday afternoons to earn a little extra cash. Went off to college, had a career in aerospace for a period of time, got an MBA. And really what, um, when he would talk about Halbert Hargrove and what they did, I said, you know, that, that really speaks to my heart. And so through an advisor that he had worked with, I had a connection into the firm and interviewed with the uh, president at the time. And there was a slot open and he uh, offered it to me. And the funny story about this is you, you have a, you know, a career for a few years, you had a grad degree, all of that. The way they operated at that point was if you're going to come into our business, you're going to start and learn it from the bottom up. And so he offered me a pay cut. He offered me a, an entry level job where I was filling out forms and things like that to learn the business. Mm -hmm. And so over time, it was a very short time period I was doing that. But over time, I began working with the managing director in the firm, working with his clients, learning the advice side of the business, mm -hmm. uh, got a CFP in the process of doing that. And then um, with that, just naturally working with clients, referrals started to come in. And so I was able to start building a book of business. At the same time, in parallel, I was also working um, and getting mentored and working on our investment committee at the firm. And so those two paths ran in parallel for a, for a number of years. And in 2012, they asked me to step into the, oh, I don't know what happened. Um, in 2012, they asked me to step into the investment committee chair role, which sets the agenda, sets the research ideas for the year and things that we were going to do. Um, and I was able to work with the CIO pretty closely over the next 10 years. And it was at the end of 2022 that he asked me to step into a full-time role as the co-chief investment officer with him. And so it's been a, it's been 18 years. It's gone by quickly. And uh, I actually enjoy the culture of this company quite a bit. I love that. That's a great story. I've heard people tell me they started, and I've read books, starting as a caddy and then ending up in investing world. I've heard lots of different ways, but mowing lawns is actually the first time. So I love that side of it. Uh, let's talk about your investment strategy, please. Yeah. So um, what Halbert Hargrove does is we are wealth advisors and investment management um, as far as what we do for individuals and families. So we work with clients in about 42 states and then also do work with some clients that are living abroad currently. Um, what our investment strategy really starts with is more of a goals-based. We consider it or we call it life phase investing. So when a client comes to us, we usually have to go through a pretty in-depth interview to find out where they're at in their financial journey, um, where they're at in their working career, what, what they're doing with this money. And what we're trying to do there is to assess where are they at with the ability to bear risks? So okay. volatility, pricing volatility, can they bear it? Is, is this a pool of money that they're planning to touch in 20, 30 years? Are they adding to it? And so we really have three sort of phases that we see clients go through. One is the build and grow phase, which is that's the early days of your career, if not you know middle of your career where you have earning potential and saving potential. You should love volatility at that point in time, right? Because if you're putting money in regularly, like say to a 401k plan, you want the markets to go on sale. Um, the clients that once they've amassed en enough money where they probably cannot save it again or replace it easily, yep. we consider them to be more in a transition phase. They're okay. likely not spending from the portfolio. They're probably got a few years to go, but their timeline to replace that money is now shortened. And so having you know a major setback is a different problem than somebody that's in a build and grow phase. Got it. And then third, we also just, you know, dealing with individuals and planning for retirement, we do have clients that go into distribution mode or, or distribute and deploy as we call it. And those are the clients, right, that are regularly drawing a certain percentage of their portfolio consistently. And that has a different risk profile to it than 
than the other two phases. So once we figure out where they are, we start determining what sort of an asset allocation would be appropriate for the goals they're trying to achieve. And we invest across most asset, most major asset classes um, within most client portfolios, assuming they can tolerate it. I love it. So it's a risk-based, I guess, investment approach first. Mm -hmm. And then let's talk about risk. How do you handle risk and what are some mistakes you see people make with respect to risk management? Oh, I, I can get into the behavioral stuff all day. I love behavioral finance. Go for it. <laughs> <Go to laughs> exactly. I see the book Hit over it. your shoulder. Hit it. Um, we're all humans. And so when you're working with individuals and families, one of the biggest mistakes that I see come in to investment decision making is emotion. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very hard because, you know, unlike an institutional client that has indefinite perpetuity, usually you're dealing with people that have a lot of problems outside of just their money. And we all have issues that we deal with in daily life. And it's trying to make sure that your time horizon and your understanding of how markets can work is that it's appropriately aligned. And so usually when we're building a portfolio, one of the biggest things that we have to be careful of is behavior. You can have one of the beautiful, uh, the most beautiful, like call it long-term track records. Like if we're researching a manager where you just kill your benchmark year over year, but if you go through like a three to five year period where you're way off, um, I'm not sure most individuals can tolerate that or understand it. And so one of the things that we really have to do when, and when building a por portfolio is our products that we're putting into a client's account going to be behaviorally accepted by them and tolerated where they're not going to bail at the wrong time on them. Right. They're going to give them time to work. So powerful. Yeah. I love that. So one of my core principles is the same thing. The whole point of the book is how people make rational, not emotional decisions. Cause mm -hmm. as you know, it's, that's, that's, that's huge. How about timeless lessons? What are some timeless lessons you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I always go with the, the common one that I, or I think it's very common. Don't try to time markets. Like mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you, you, it, your chances, it's especially um, in this business, the ability to time and get in and out of markets and switch in and out of things is extremely difficult at this point. Um, I feel like everybody says that, very few people follow it. And, you know, part of our job as advisors is really to coach people along the way and avoid those common reactions where you're like, ah, oh, things aren't good. There, things aren't looking good this year. Um, and I use last year as a great example because it's contemporary. Mm -hmm. uh, coming into the year, and this is where I really have to kind of beat up on forecasters, they have a very tough job because no one knows the future, but they're trying to make educated guesses and they have right. very convincing arguments. 2023 coming into the year, it just seemed like more doom and gloom. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. And, you know, markets, and I'll just use stocks and bonds, things floated along for the first nine months of the year. There were big, draw, there, you know, a normal drawdown well in excess of 10% on stocks. Mm -hmm. It didn't look good coming into October either. Mm -hmm. And yet the last 90 days of the year, we saw a huge pickup in returns. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the that's the real danger of trying to forecast the short term or even the long term that I see investors get caught up in because it's so easy to just buy into the headlines. And yeah. those are the dangerous moments you can't miss. Got it. So how about rebalancing? Do you rebalance the portfolio at all or do you just buy and hold? No, so we do rebalancing and we do what one of the active things that we do in portfolios is with financial markets and with products or wrappers, vehicles that you can get a client into that are diversified with those rapidly changing. Uh, we are always looking at ways to possibly change out, do things at a better, um, better entry point, also managing costs and things of that nature within the portfolio, because everything's going to have a cost to it to a degree. Yeah, um, but the rebalancing we do for a client as we watch them migrate through their life phase, there is going to be a natural rebalancing that occurs as either financial events, you know, whether it's money coming in or whether or not they have a big surprise that they need to take money out, we will start to rebalance. Um, it's, you know, within an average calendar year, there are a handful of changes that are made in the portfolio that naturally rebalance the portfolio, but you know, I don't want to go back to a 2008, 2009 environment where you're actively rebalancing because the stock side of the portfolio became so underweight 
yep. right? relative to fixed income or alternatives at that point mm -hmm. that you almost were forced to rebalance because of the deviations. Yeah, no, I hear you a lot of clear. So thank you for that. How about timeless mistakes? What are some timeless mistakes you see people make and how do you avoid them? Um, so the, the, the one thing that uh, gets back to behavioral finance, right? We're all humans. We like to, you know, tell people how good we're doing on things. One of the timeless mistakes that I see is that with short-term returns, and I mean anything, this, this sounds funny, but anything under 10 years, there's a lot of noise. Yes. And one of the things that I see, and it's it it's to nobody's fault. It's just what the world was taught. Yeah. If if you handed a client just indexes, just basic stock indexes today, and you said, "Here's the U.S. large market. Here's the U.S. small market. Here's international developed, and here's emerging markets," and you only showed them, call it five and ten year returns, mm -hmm. and you asked them, "What would you do? Would you yeah. pick? What would you pick?" The natural tendency is to go. I want to go buy the uh, you know the U.S. large cap market because it's done the best, and the others aren't ever going to come back. And I'd say that's one of the mistakes that we make is that we're so short. Not us, but just people in general is that we're so short term that we're chasing returns. Hundred percent. And <laughs> and I would say you know one of the questions you have to ask is why is that why has that gone up so much and does the other two really not have a, you know you know a purpose anymore? And I'd argue with with a ton of the market or ton of the opportunities outside the U.S. to avoid being 100 percent concentrated in one single thing, Understood. even if the returns don't look good, because uh, you, you'll remember this. You go back to 2010. And I remember I was pretty early in Halbert Hargrove at that time. You go back and I will tell you, most clients did not even want to own the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. Flash forward 10 more years, and now everybody wants to own the S&P 500 and yeah. nothing else. <laughs> so those are those are the those are the things that um, can really fool investors in the in the short run. I love that, Brian. So I use the analogy of a red light, green light. After every red light, you get a green light, vice versa. So you, <laughs> you'll get where I'm going. Yeah. So yeah. It makes and chasing returns. I see that all the time. A manager has a good run for two years. Everybody wants in, but inevitably he's going to have a drawdown. And then people get, oh my God, they bought, you know, and even in the market, same thing. So I, okay, I love that. How about I, I, I there was, I, I remember this was one of the things we were looking at a specific small cap manager. And this was many, many years ago. I won't name them, but. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal track record. When you look at the the rolling period returns are always deceiving, but when you look at the rolling period returns, you're just like, wow, they're just crushing their benchmark. Yeah. How are they doing that? And then you start to dig in and you start to get calendar year returns. And then you look at the fund flows along those calendar years and you see exactly that. They've had a phenomenal track record. The problem was is that none of the investors stayed in for that track record or right. a majority of them bailed when it got bad yeah only to miss the really good years where their selection paid off i hear you and that we can't use like that's the behavioral thing that's a really difficult strategy to use with individuals yeah no i get that loud and clear because when things go down they panic and they want out and then things go up they want in but it's after the big move up it's so. after the returns yeah, yeah. okay well, got it how about um Timeless advice. What's some timeless advice you'd like to share with the audience or give your 30 year old self? Oh, the, yeah, that this one is this one is a no, I would say a no brainer. But the earlier you can start investing, at least something, the better off you'll be. And it's very I, I will just say it is a marathon, um, especially if you're trying to build a nest egg for the future in the sense that usually your first 10 plus years of saving and investing feel like slow, very stable. It doesn't seem like it's going up. And, and what I mean, I'll use this example. Client comes to me and they say, I'm going to invest $1,000 and then just use an arbitrary number. Yeah. If it goes up 20%, like think of the dollar term, what that really means. I hear you. It's, and two months. Yeah. it's not, it's <laughs> the percentage is cool, but the dollar isn't right. Yeah. It, and then you start to build that base. And when that base gets big enough, mm -hmm. the percentages start to mean a lot more in dollars. And so what you eventually will start to see, and I tell people this, it's like, get your first job and just try to save anything you can into either a Roth IRA or a 401k, whatever you can do to force yourself to start saving mm -hmm. and get invested. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to have a lot of different market cycles, but get invested and um, and really focus on you have control over your savings. 
you don't have control over markets. What you do want to do is get in so that you have a long enough time period to participate and eventually get that base to where you have a year like last year and you're like, oh my goodness, like it produced more dollar returns than I was able to even save into the plan or into whatever account you're using to do that. Yeah, I love so, that. That is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it's just like, don't put it off because 30s and 40s come quickly. They do. I, and they also I'm go like, quickly too, Brian. They all, they all <laughs> well, beautiful. Thank you so much, Brian, for coming on the show. This has been absolutely uh, fantastic. And hopefully we'll see yeah. you again soon. Yeah, keep, keep going with the behavioral stuff. I The more people hear it, the more it gets ingrained in them. And it's great. I definitely will. Thank you kindly. All right. Thanks, Adam. Thank you.